Hero and Leander may be Marlowe's most successful, most charming, non-dramatic poem. It is unfinished. It is a translation of uh, the 5th century A.D. poet Musaeus. It is originally in a number of Cestiads, named after Cestos, one of the cities where it's set. It's a traditional mythological story. Marlowe doesn't live to finish it, or doesn't finish it. He has written only two Cestiads, and then broken off with the, the Latin phrase descent nonula, something is missing. And the good news for you is you only have to read those two Cestiads. Your book does include a continuation of who by George Chapman, who completed the translation and adaptation. Um, and you have another version by Henry Pito. Um, let's just say Henry Pito, very much not famous. And if you read his translation, I think... I think you'll see why. Chapman, um, mid-level famous, Chapman is the first Englishman to translate Homer. Um, his first installment of his translation of the Iliad comes out the same year that Hero and Leander and his continuation of Hero and Leander come out. A few things. Who is Musaeus? Not who Marlowe thinks it is. Marlowe, like every educated person of his time and place, believed that this poem was written by the mythological, legendary, semi-mythical or outright mythical poet Musaeus, who is a companion of the, um, a companion and contemporary of the extremely mythical Greek poet Orpheus, who features in all kinds of legends. This is not, and this would make Musaeus like the oldest of poets, which is what Marlowe calls him. This is not that Musaeus. Early modern classicists were confused. Specifically, they had <laughs> they had confused a figure, a much much later figure named Musaeus the grammarian, or Musaeus grammaticus, or Musaeus the school teacher, that's what Musaeus the grammarian means in this context, with the kind of ancient heroic figure. That's a big mistake. Right? Or that mistake changes a lot. So um, people used to read Hero and Leander and be like, oh my god, this is where it all comes from. You can see how everybody else is imitating this poem because they thought it was more than a thousand years older than it was so they gave Musaeus credit for having influenced the 11 or 1200 years of people who came at, who came before him um, in fact when you understand that this is like written in like the 400s AD then it becomes super derivative it's actually imitating those things not influencing them does that mean it's not great? Does that mean it's not entertaining? No. But Marlowe's translation is much more important for English literature than Musaeus's original is for classical literature. It comes very late in the day. Marlowe is translating again. He has Greek, and it's a moment where not a lot of Greek has been translated into the early modern world. We think of the Greek, we think of the English Renaissance as being all about the Greeks and Romans. It was much more about the Romans. You learn to speak Latin pretty early in the educational system, somewhere around what we would call the beginning of high school or middle school, um, if you got that far and a lot of people didn't. You know, and then if you went to a really good school, you'd pick up some Greek too. But they, the early modern English, the educated people, the university graduates, they know some Greek. Certainly they know some Greek. They are fluent in Latin. <laughs> there are high school dropouts who, or rather grammar school dropouts, whose Latin is incredibly good. Um, and they haven't translated a lot directly from Greek into Latin yet. They don't, there's a lot of Greek literature they just don't have. They always have the Roman version. 
Marla can go right to the Greek, though he is not a faithful adapter here. When it came to Ovid, he was going to do this line by line as accurately as possible. Here, he's going to do what he wants to do. This is a free adaptation. In some ways, a kind of standard Elizabethan translation, they are very freewheeling about accuracy. They are most, what's most important to Elizabethan translators is that it sound good in English. Sounds cool, beats accurate for them. In every case, always. Including, like, Marlowe just makes stuff up in the middle of the first Sestiad. There's that long story about how, like, Mercury um, gets into some hijinks and therefore is cursed. And this is a fable that explains why scholars are poor. Um, that's all Marlowe. It's not in It's not in Musaeus. He's just decided to, like, interpolate what he wants. Musaeus is also full of, like, has these sexy stories in it, um, but is also full of kind of philosophical and moral points to make. And Marlowe doesn't care about the phil philosophical points. He cares that, um, he cares in, in, he wants to make it fun and funny, and he cares that both of his lead characters are super hot. He wants to talk about their hotness. In this, he follows his role model, Ovid, who likes things that are funny irreverent um there's that joke there's that joke where like okay we're looking at like here's here in the temple you can see all the things the gods have gotten up to and it's like and it's a list of crimes those are a list right out of ovid like all the terrible things they've done these are the kinds of things you can do when you don't take the classical gods very seriously and marlo if 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 Ovid doesn't, and Musaeus does more than Ovid, Marlowe doesn't have to take those people seriously at all. This poem is often called an apillion. I'm going to tell you that word just because it'll be in the criticism, or it's a minor epic, a kind of erotic short epic. It is like just barely a genre. It's a thing that has a fad kind of under 10 years in the 1590s. And so there's a brief moment where Elizabethans are writing Apillions, these sexy minor epics. One of Shakespeare's Shakespeare's first published book is, is one of them, is Venus and Adonis. And it's all, you know, it's a racy, fun narrative poem. Um, they like them. It's about as much a genre as you can say, like, 80s new wave synth pop is. It's like, yeah, that's a thing. It's recognizable. Um, but it's around for, like... I don't know, a decade at most? Yeah, um, we don't have to worry about that too much. But some, some critics really love to have technical terms, so the technical term epilion is out there. This is a poem where Marlowe is out to have fun. He's back to rhyming iambic pentameter couplets. He's using the couplet form again to make jokes, to be funny, to be light. Things are, everything here is in a major key, partly because it's unfinished, it has a happy ending. Nearly any story can have a happy ending, if you finish it soon enough. Romeo and Juliet, and, and right after Act 2, happy ending, yes? Every, almost every horror movie you've seen can be a short film about a lovely young couple moving into their dream house. Another way to look at it is maybe Marlowe hasn't finished because he likes the happy ending. Spoilers, you don't have to read the other Cestids. Let me tell you what happens. They die. Leander drowns, because they're swimming back and forth between Cestus and Abydos. This is, this is now in, what is now Turkey, um, it's in the Straits uh, of, a, of the Hellespont. And, uh, and, then, and then Hero kills herself. Bad times. But we just have good times here. In fact, the, um, the, the most gay episode, the queerest episode in the first two, when, when our boy Leander is swimming off to get him for his heterosexual love object, and Neptune's kind of like, hey, 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 I'll be waiting for you when you come back, good-looking young man. Um, and in which Leander says, I am no woman, I, and Neptune just laughs. Yeah, he knows you're not a woman, Leander. He really knows. He's not interested in you because he thinks you're only, he knows you're a man. Oh, he knows. Um, that is actually also ominous. Like, okay, you've got a complicated relationship with a sexually harassing sea god, um, and you have to swim back and forth to your primary love object. What could go wrong? What could go wrong? 
On the other hand, there is a sheer, for the two Cestians we have, there's a sheer reveling in beauty with no, kind of no, there's almost no shadow here. It is a moment like Marlowe is reveling in the over-the-top descriptions of how beautiful his characters are, how sexy they are, how great love is, especially right at the beginning, and his famous line, whoever loved that love not at first sight, something that Shakespeare later quotes with a kind of ambiguous reference to Marlowe as he quotes it, um, and where the poetry is beautiful. Everything can be pretty. It's all good. We just have to end after the second Cestian.